You're gonna do that. Hello, this is Matt Lippert. I'm gonna be your host today for this uh, session. Uh, we're gonna be talking about ins and outs of cocktail forage mixes for dairy rations for our, our first uh, presentation. Uh, this is the same group that last uh, couple weeks ago put together uh, the Badger Dairy Initiative uh, silages from feeding behavior to pricing. So this is a work group that's been working on nutrition topics. Uh, besides myself, Matt Lippert, who uh, I'm an ag educator in Clark and Wood County, specializing in dairy. We also have uh, Jackie McCarville uh, from uh, Green County, Ashley Olson from Vernon County, and then the other, our speakers today. So Matt Akins, our first speaker is in the group, and then Luis Ferraretto, uh, we'll be speaking after. So uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, if you want to uh, do a, a, a question of the speaker, the best way to get that done is to go to your chat function on Zoom and uh, uh, type it in your question there and then I'll, I'll uh, utilize that. This BDI, Badger Dairy Initiative, has uh, been running uh, bi-weekly at this time, uh, Tuesdays from 1 to 2.30. Through the winter here, I think we have sessions going on until April, and uh, this will be the last nutrition focus one. And you can, uh, I think we'll put in the chat if you're interested in the rest of the programs. Uh, uh, you can still register, obviously we have to send you the link. So uh, uh, do that if you want to sign up for some of the upcoming programs. And with that, our first speaker today is uh, Matt Akins. And his topic, you see on the screen, uh, ins and outs of cocktail forage mixes for dairy rations. A little bit about Matt. Um, he is associate scientist and extension dairy specialist with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he's stationed uh, in Marshfield, uh, where we have the Marshfield Ag Research Station and we have a dairy herd there. Uh, Matt's research focuses on dairy heifer nutrition, including high fiber forages, mm -hmm limit feeding of heifers, grazing. His current research and extension work is looking into the use of cocktail forage mixes, which there's been a lot of interest in those, and also feeding and management of dairy beef and crossbred cattle. So with that, uh, Matt, take it uh, away for us. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Uh, appreciate the introduction. I'm actually gonna shut my video off because so that our internet doesn't slow down and I don't get kicked off. So I'm gonna stop my video. But if you do have questions during the, the talk, make sure to enter those into the chat and we'll try to address those um, either during the talk or we can uh, address those after. So today we're gonna to discuss um, a recent project uh, that we've been conducting across the state. Um, it was funded by the UW Dairy Innovation Hub. So I wanna give um, just us uh, recognition that they provided funding support for this, this project. I uh, also just wanna recognize the other uh, collaborators. Um, Aaron Kamen uh, is a, was an undergrad student uh, from UW Platteville that um, did a lot of the work initially on the project with planting and with uh, harvesting. And Jamie Patton assisted with planting at the Peninsula location. And then Kevin Jarek and, and Mike Ball were really important with the on-farm data collections where they um, gather data from um, farms, including yield and quality. So. And then Luis will be discussing some of the work that he's also doing in the next talk on, on cocktail forage mixes. So yeah, there's been a lot of interest in using cocktail forage mixes the last few years, um, especially in the 2019, there was obviously we had uh, fairly wet conditions in the spring that caused uh, some delayed planting of, of corn and replanting, um, and eventually some, some producers were ended up 
needing to go with some emergency forages and cocktail mixes and some of these warm season annuals uh, were fairly popular in using uh, during that time. And then consequently, there's been increased use of these the past few years as people have uh, began to found, find that the quality of these can be fairly good. Um, typically, how these are managed, they're used after a uh, spring harvested cereal grain forage like uh, rye or triticale. So that's fairly common now to put these cocktail forage mixes after uh, a harvest. Uh, however, there's not a lot of data on these, these mixes across the state. So we, we tried to um, look at that in this project. There was a, a small project done in Wapaka County in uh, uh, that uh, Greg Blondie, who's the previous uh, extension agent in the county that uh, worked with, with me and the farmer to uh, gather data on different um, forages. And as you can see in the table, um, there was a winter rye uh, forage that was harvested in, uh, in mid to late May had about three quarters of a ton harvested uh, per acre, uh, fairly good quality, uh, moderate protein, uh, a good NDF content uh, was harvested uh, right about the boot stage, a very good fiber digestibility, which we often see in these cereal grain forages over 70% NDF digestibility at, at 30 hours. And then we compared um, different mix or different forages that we planted after the winter rye or actually with the winter rye. So there's corn silage, which is often commonly put in after these sugar and forages and at the farm, uh, they, they harvested about seven tons of dry matter, um, fairly good quality corn silage, about 40 uh, NDF and uh, good NDF stability about 60%. So fairly normal corn silage that you'd see uh, around the state. And then we had a cocktail mix, which was a, a mix of sorghum sedan grass um, and Italian rye and, and different legumes. And across the three cuttings, I was taken uh, over three cuttings. It was planted in early June. And we harvested about four tons of dry matter total across those three cuttings. A good protein content, I average about 16%. 45% NDF and very good NDF digestibility on these um, on that cocktail mix during that study, almost 70%. And that's the a big reason why producers and nutritionists like to use these mixes as it can get fairly good NDF digestibility. And then we looked at ryegrass, an annual ryegrass um, is what we put in. They actually interseeded it into the winter rye uh, before harvesting it. Uh, and we had across four cuttings, about four tons of dry matter, really good protein, 16% of protein and 50% NDF and fairly good NDF digestibility. I would expect NDF digestibility to be a bit higher on Italian ryegrass. Um, this annual ryegrass actually headed out about 25% of the crop did head out. So it became fairly a bit more mature than uh, ideal. Uh, but on an Italian ryegrass stand, we'd expect that to be uh, quite a bit higher NDF digestibility above that. But if you compare this to alfalfa, um, if you compare the cocktail mix uh, to the alfalfa, fairly close in yield. Obviously, the protein is not going to be as good. But the big thing is this NDF digestibility again, the main reason why producers and nutritionists are looking possibly at using these cocktail mixes. So we wanted to evaluate this a bit further. Um, so we had a really good sized project with three main objectives. Um, so objective one was to, to look at the yield and quality of this cocktail mix at two different locations. So at Marshfield, it's, uh, fairly wet uh, soils, um, cool soils um, compared to a peninsula, uh, a bit a bit more wet, better drained soils in that location. Um, and then different climates. So obviously we're closer to the lake, so they have a bit cooler climate than we do in the rest of the state. And then we looked at different row widths and then uh, different depths. So we wanted to try to see if we planted those, uh, like the sorghum sedan grass at uh, narrow or wider row 
row spacing that that would allow those smaller seeds and small the cool season plants to establish uh, a better between the, the wider rows. And then the depths, we we're looking to see if there's differences in how the depth of the small seeded, uh, like plants like the ryegrass and the, the legumes, if that would help them establish. And we looked at different clover varieties, so two northern adapted and then two southern or adapted. And those are the southern adapted varieties are uh, often considered annuals, so they're a bit faster growing. Um, so we wanted to compare and see if those would be uh, have maybe have better growth during that initial year for those southern varieties. Another objective was we collected uh, on-farm yield data from four uh, Wisconsin farms in four different counties. And we'll go through that data. And there's, um, so there's one from Sheboygan, um, Outagami, Okano, and Marathon. So we're trying to look at different regions and different soil types, different weather patterns, and seeing how that might affect the uh, yield and quality of, of this cocktail mix. And lastly, we had a, a lactating cow feeding study at, at Marshfield research station that we did um, this past fall. So first off, I wanna go through some of the data that we had from the plot data. So this, this graph is showing the yields at Marshfield from the row spacing and depth. So on the, this, on the left, we have the, uh, the narrow, with treatment and the, the normal depth. So it's seeded at seven and a half inch rows and three about three quarter inch depth for all the seeding. And we had a narrow width for all the seeds, but we plot, we put the small seeds into the small seed box. We separated the seeds out and tried to see if there was, if seeding those at a shallower depth helped those. And then we had a narrow spacing when, which we put all the seeds at in the main box, and then we adjust the depth on that to a quarter of it, uh, to a half an inch. And then we got a wide spacing for the sorghum sedan. And then we separated the seeds out into the, the, um, the grass seed box and set that at a quarter of an inch. So we're really just trying to see if the different widths and the different depths will, will maybe help especially those small seeded uh, grasses and legumes to establish. But as you can see, we didn't really see any effect on uh, yield across the different treatments. So across the treatments, we got about one and a half tons of dry matter in the first cutting, which is primarily all um, uh, sorghum sedan grass. And we had a fairly high weed pressure as well. So a lot of barnyard grass was uh, came in during that first harvest. In the second harvest, it was a lot more of the ryegrass and less of the uh, weed content in that harvest. But we harvested about one to 1.2 tons of dry matter, really very little difference across the treatments. And then the last harvest, which was in uh, mid to late October, was pretty much all ryegrass, very good stand actually. You'll see pictures of next. Um, and we harvested about 0.6 tons of dry matter from that. So total, we harvested about 3.2 to 3.5 tons of dry matter across the three harvests for that, for this study. As far as legume content, we really didn't see anything in the first, uh, first harvest. It just started to come in during that second. And then the third harvest, we started to see a bit more legume content, about 10 to 15% of the, the dry matter came from the legumes. So, and a lot of that came from the bursine clover uh, and a little bit from the, the hairy vetch. If we look at some pictures from the first harvest, so you can see there's a lot of, a lot of uh, weed content, very, again, about 30 to 60% of the dry matter came from weeds. Um, that the sorghum sedan grass really struggled um, after planting. We had good planting conditions, very warm days, and then it got wet in the, in the middle of June. So it really kind of struggled after with those wetter conditions. In the second harvest, we started to see less weeds 
more of the ryegrass really took over that that stand and then a surface dan grass started to to tail off a little bit uh, we harvested it probably a little bit too close at about three to four inch cut height really for that sorghum sedan grass we got to cut that about six inches to get really good regrowth so that's something to consider when you're harvesting these cocktail mixes you really want to kind of raise that cutter bar a little bit to try to avoid cutting that sorghum sedan to the ground and by third harvest you'd see that that ryegrass really dominated the really nice standard ryegrass uh, we're actually going to look at harvesting that this spring to see if that'll overwinter and see if we get an early spring harvest off that off those plots. If we look at Peninsular, that was an entirely different type of uh, conditions. Um, the the sorghum sedan grass would dominated both cuttings. We actually only got two cuttings from the Peninsular plots because the ryegrass and the legumes did not really establish at all. Very little of that, those seeds actually uh, came up. So you can see in this first harvest, these are the same treatments. The first harvest of the, of the mix, which was mainly sorghum stand, was about, about 0.7 to one ton of dry matter of the sorghum stand grass. That was about 36 inches tall when we took that. Uh, very little weed content at that first harvest. But by that second harvest, we had a, an immense amount of pressure from crabgrass. Um, about 25 to 40% of the dry matter came from the crabgrass in the second harvest, which averaged about two and a half tons of dry matter. The sorghum stand grass was about, it was a little taller and more mature than we would have liked. It was about 50 to 60 inches tall, but um, we got a little late on that cutting. So we got a pretty good yield off of it, but I'm betting the quality is not going to be very good. We haven't done, got the quality data back from that, these treatments yet. But the yields were, were pretty good, uh, especially that sink and harvest. And overall, we about three and a half tons off those two cuttings, um, mainly from that sink and cutting uh, of the especially the sorghum stand grass being taller. I think the main issue was with the, the, the ryegrass and the legumes likely didn't establish well because our depth was probably a little too deep uh, in the drill that we used. So we probably need to do a little bit better job of really kind of dialing in that depth, especially for those ryegrass and legumes. If we get anything over about a half inch, three quarters of an inch, we're probably gonna be uh, burying those seeds too deep. So we really need to, to work on getting that uh, dialed in and being a bit more careful about um, getting that depth because those ryegrass and legumes just would not come up through that. So next we're gonna go on to the on-farm data collection part of the project. Um, so as far as management, um, three of the farm locations had uh, planted a cereal grain in the fall. Um, I think two of them were triticale and one of them was rye. Um, and then they took a, a cereal grain forage harvest in May. And then they came back and then put a cocktail forage mix in, uh, in uh, early June after that cereal grain forage harvest. As far as the mix compositions, three of the farms use a, a warm season annual base mix, uh, about 35 pounds of the BMR sorghum sedan grass, uh, about 25% from Italian ryegrass, and then 5% from uh, different legumes. So red clover, brucine clover, and hairy vetch are very commonly used in these uh, cocktail forage mixes. Uh, the other farm used a, a completely different type of mix um, based on mainly cow peas, um, and then ryegrass, and then a mix of other uh, seeds, uh, millet, alfalfa, red clover, timothy, and, and radish. As far as fertility, um, two of the farms only use commercial nitrogen. Um, the one farm that planted the cow pea base mix uh, put nitrogen out only at planting. Um, 
because they had a fairly poor stand and then they didn't um, reapply nitrogen after that because they had a, a drought conditions. So they had to, they didn't feel it was really a good conditions to apply nitrogen because it was so dry. Uh, the Marshfield Research Station, which is one of the sites uh, we applied uh, nitrogen after uh, each cutting. So about 45 pounds of nitrogen from urea for each cutting. Um, and the other farm, uh, other farms uh, used a kind of combination of manure and uh, commercial nitrogen. One farm injected liquid manure, liquid manure pre-plant. Uh, so they came in after that cereal harvest and then put uh, nitrogen or put manure into the ground. And then they also came back with a little bit of nitrogen for that first cutting after it came up. And then between cuttings, they applied uh, commercial nitrogen at 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. The last farm used commercial nitrogen at planting, about 60 to 70 pounds at planting, and then came back with manure in between cuttings, about 6,000 gallons of manure for each. So a little bit kind of variation depending on the, the management at each farm and how they, they manage fertility. We'll go through a few pictures from the different operations. So these are from the farm in Outagamie County. Uh, the, the picture on the left is a, a, of the uh, cereal grain forage harvest. So it's taken out a fairly uh, vegetative state, probably just before boot stage, excellent quality feed that, that they're putting up there. Um, and the picture on the right is of after the first uh, cocktail harvest. Um, so there's quite a bit of weed content based on the observations of, of uh, Kevin, the uh, ex extension agent in the county and the farmer. Um, so they had a fairly high weed pressure uh, because the cowpeas, they came up pretty nice at first, but then when it got dry, the um, they kind of died back and didn't really contribute a lot to the to that mix. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't uh, really predict the weather in that, in that kind of situation. Possibly a sorghum sedan or a warm season annual might have uh, done a bit better in that kind of situation, but obviously we can't predict the weather. So next uh, is a some pictures from the O'Connell County uh, farm. So this is of uh, a first harvest. You can see a, a, an excellent stand of the BMR sorghum sedan grass. Um, so very um, good establishment. Uh, you can see in the right picture they did have a bit of the legume starting to come up through and actually uh, emerge underneath that canopy. So that's, that's good to see, but not a lot. You would expect with how much legume you put in there that you'd, you'd expect a bit more of that, those legume seeds to contribute. And you're picking up a little bit of that ryegrass, those thinner leaves down below that canopy, but not a, not, not a massive amount in that first harvest. And this is uh, pictures from the third harvest at the O'Connell County farm. And really what's telling is really interesting. Um, I'm glad Kevin sent these to me is that on the left side, you can see the was a part of the, that field that did not receive manure. You can see how yellow, yellow that plant is. The yield is uh, quite a bit less than on the right side where it did have manure applied. So it just shows you that these annual grasses um, really require quite a bit of of fertility and nitrogen to really um, get a good amount of yield. You can see there's a pretty dramatic effect there. So now we'll move on to the, the yield data from the on-farm uh, work. Uh, so on, so farm number one, this was in Sheboygan County. You can see it, the cereal grain forage across the farms was about one to one and a half tons of dry matter across the three farms that harvested it. So fairly consistent. That's about what we would expect uh, based on previous data with these cereal grain forages, about one to one and a half, maybe up to two tons if you let it get a bit more mature. But right about one ton is what you might expect uh, just part of that boot stage. If 
you look at the second heart, the, the cocktail uh, harvest for the first, you can see right around a little under one and a half, maybe up to two tons of dry matter. And again, that's mainly across these farms is mainly going to be the sorghum sedan grass uh, is going to make the most of that mix. Very little of that ryegrass or that uh, legumes are going to really contribute to that first cutting. If you look at the second cutting, uh, that, that farm number one had a bit of a, a decreased uh, yield at that operation. Um, so about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 tons of dry matter. At the second farm, again, I this is the farm in, uh, out of Gamey County. They had a pretty, uh, they had very poor conditions, uh, drought conditions, and they actually waited about about two, two and a half months between the first cutting and the second cutting. So that's, they took up those two cuttings about one to one and a half tons of dry matter each. The third farm was the farm in O'Connell County that applied manure in between each cutting. You can see they definitely maintained yield a bit uh, higher than the other farms. So the first through third cutting, they about one to one and a half to two tons of dry matter uh, yield for that farm. Now you could tell from those pictures that, that that forage is quite a bit taller, so you'd expect those yields to be a bit higher. But if we when we look at the quality data, that the quality of that forage is not going to be as good as what it was from from the farms one and two. And the last farm number four that was from the Marshfield Station. You could see that was the first harvest that we took off was all sorghum sedan grass, about two tons of dry matter. And then that second harvest and third harvest was mainly ryegrass, um, about 0.8 to one ton of dry matter is what we took off for those, those two harvests of, of ryegrass. So you can see there's a lot of variability in these mixes. And that, that's one issue that we were a little concerned with is that you get a lot of variation with these warm season and cool season mixes that is that first harvest is usually going to be fairly good, a lot higher yield, quality might be a little bit lower. Uh, but then that second and third harvest, quality might be a little bit better, but the yields are generally going to be a, a, maybe a bit less due to the uh, primarily being from ryegrass or from the, the legumes, depending on your conditions. But the, you can see there's quite a bit of variability across the farms as far as yield. We start looking at quality. Um, again, there's some variability there. Um, you look at the cereal grain forage that's in the blue bars. Very good quality, uh, 16 to 22% protein. So these were well fertilized uh, cereal grain forages. Um, if we look at this, the cocktail mixes, uh, generally, these are going to be a bit less, especially for the warm season annuals, the sorghum sedan grass, uh, about uh, 14 to 15 percent for the, the three farms. Um, and then farm four, that was the, the Marshfield station, that was a bit more mature, and it was about eight or nine percent protein. Uh, if we look at second and third cuttings, um, about 10 to 15%, and that's probably driven a lot by the, the nitrogen fertility um, and also the maturity you can see on farm three, as I mentioned before, that you had the higher yields, but the, the quality, the protein content was, was driven down by that, um, that higher yield, it was diluted out. But generally what we've seen before in the previous work is about 12 to 15 or 16% protein on these these uh, cocktail mixes. As far as NDF digestibility, looking at the cereal grain forages uh, on the, the first two farms, very good fiber digestibility, 75% uh, at 30 hours. Farm three had a, a higher yield. Uh, we would expect that maybe it's got a little bit more mature and then the, the quality declined a bit and it was only at 55%. NDFD. If we look at the cocktail mix on farm one, a fairly consistent, um, about 55 to 65 percent 
uh, fiber digestibility. Uh, farm two, good quality on that first cutting. Uh, that second cutting probably, obviously, it, it sat for about two to two and a half months due to the drought conditions to allow it to grow and the quality definitely declined as it as it uh, went through that and mature. Farm three, uh, a very consistent, um, had very consistent yields, very consistent uh, uh, protein and NDF digestibility as well, right around 50%. So uh, again, the yield, high yield for that farm, but a bit lower quality for these cocktail mixes. And then for farm four at, at the Marshfield station, uh, lower quality for this, this first harvest, but fairly, fairly good quality for the second and, and third cutting, especially this third cutting was all Italian ragrass. Uh, and it had very good, very good quality and NDF digestibility. Again, variability is, is a concern with these forages because you're going to have different forages possibly in each cutting. So that's something to consider with managing these. As far as RFQ, um, very good, very high RFQ values for the surrogate forages, 200 to 250. So excellent, excellent quality feed. You could use that in really any lactating dairy cow ration and perform very well. Uh, farm one, uh, very fairly consistent again, similar to the fiber digestibility, about 120 to 150. So you could fit some of these probably into lactating cow ration, but uh, you'd have to make some tweaks to the um, diet a bit, especially for this lower uh, RFQ. Uh, as far as the uh, first cutting on for farm number two in the red bar, uh, a bit a very fairly good quality, about 150, but that second cutting probably can be more for heifer uh, dry cow feed. Uh, farm three, again, higher yields, but that quality really is, is going to be possibly an issue to include that in, in the lactating cow rations. So it's just something to consider is the cutting height, especially if you have a lot of sorghum sedan, you want to really target about three foot cutting height for that and not let it get overly mature. So moving on to the, the lactating cow feeding project. Um, so we did this at the, the Marshfield Ag Research Station. Um, so we did this last fall. So it started in late September and we ran it through uh, early December. So a total of, of a 10 week study. Uh, we used 32 first lactation cows. So we have all uh, first lactation cows at the Marshfield Research Station. Um, all of them were mid lactation, 50 to 150 days of milk at the start of the trial. Um, so we had, for the first two weeks, we fed a, what we call a covariate diet. So it's a control diet. So we're all on the same diet to get them acclimated and to be able to measure differences once they're moved on to the treatment diets. So then they're moved on to the treatment diets for eight weeks. Um, and they were fed and mainly in October and November, about a month after the uh, cocktail mix uh, silage was harvested. So the cocktail mix silage is only fermenting for about 30 days after, um, after it was harvested. So the control treatment was just, it was a corn silage and alfalfa grass silage uh, base uh, in the forage. The treatment was corn silage and the cocktail mix, uh, the second harvest. And we did that, did that deliberately, choosing the second harvest so we could get a combination of the sorghum sedan grass and ryegrass and hopefully some of the legumes in that, in that mix. Otherwise, if we took the first harvest, it's primarily going to be only sorghum sedan. Um, so we want to try to get a mix of those different forages. And we did have some issue with the cocktail mix. Uh, silage. Uh, we did have some heating and, and yeast uh, mold growth in that silage through the slow feed out rate. Um, so when we opened it, it looked beautiful. Uh, within about two weeks of feeding, we had some uh, obviously air entry into the bag um, and that caused some yeast and mold growth. So we had to do a lot of cleanup of the bag and uh, 
feeding of trying to find the best quality forage without the yeast growth to feed to the lactating cows. So you might look at possibly using a, a heterofermentative um, type uh, inoculant with these. They're fairly high in sugars usually, the cocktail mixes are, especially due to the, the, uh, cock, the sorghum sedan grass. Um, so having a heterofermentative uh, inoculant that can produce some acetic acid probably is a good idea to help uh, reduce issues with um, at feed out. So it's going to con help control those yeasts, especially from feeding on that excess sugar that's in left in the in the silage. As far as forage quality, um, if we look especially, I want to look at comparing the alfalfa grass and the cocktail mix, uh, the crude protein of the alfalfa. Silage was about 20% uh, compared to the cocktail, which is about 15. So obviously we have to make some modifications in, in the diet mix to adjust for that uh, difference in protein. NDF content, obviously higher in those grasses. So about 48 to 50%. But if you look at the NDF digestibility, that's where we start to see some advantage, about 60% for the cocktail mix compared to 50 for the alfalfa grass mix. And then that carries over into the, the undigestible NDF at 240 hours. So it's a lower content in that cocktail forage mix, 12% of dry matter compared to 17% for the alfalfa grass silage. Fairly similar energy content of those two though, about 63% total digestible nutrients. So fairly similar energy content, really just differences in probably where that energy is coming from um, more fiber, more energy from fiber for the cocktail mix, probably more from the non-fiber carbohydrates and the uh, alfalfa grass silage and the, and the protein. Look at the diet composition, uh, essentially very similar diets, mainly differences. One had the alfalfa grass silage and one had the cocktail mix. So we're at about 29% corn silage, 18% of either of the haylages, uh, dry corn, 18 to 19%. We did have to include a bit of soybean meal in the cocktail uh, TMR to again, adjust for that difference in protein between the alfalfa and the cocktail mix silages. But the other ingredients were all the same, same amount of protein mix. We did feed, feed a liquid whey permeate, about 9% of dry matter, and then a mineral, and then a bit of urea as well. As far as the nutrient content, we tried to get that as close as possible, especially for protein, 16.5% uh, approximately for both. Uh, NDFOM, uh, about a bit lower for the control diet because of the lower fiber content in the alfalfa silage, about 20 five and a half to 26% compared to about 27% for the cocktail mix and a bit lower starch content for the cocktail mix because of the higher fiber content. As far as energy content, it's a bit lower estimated energy content for the cocktail mix, uh, mainly due to probably the a bit higher starch content on the control diet. So now we'll get into some actual results from the feeding trial. Um, intakes actually were very similar, uh, even though they are a bit different in fiber content. Uh, so about 57 pounds of dry matter intake for these first lactation cows, uh, fairly good intakes. Even with the cocktail mix silage having some feed out issues and some yeast issues, the it didn't seem to affect those cows at all as far as intake goes. Uh, as far as milk, um, the, the control group did have uh, significantly higher milk production, about two pounds more milk uh, per day, as far as the, the raw milk, the unadjusted. As far as the efficiency, the control group did have slightly higher efficiency as far as uh, the amount of milk per pound of dry matter intake. However, when we looked at the energy correct to milk, so that takes into consideration the fat percent and the, the protein and the lactose percent, uh, there, was, there was not a significant difference between those two treatments. So they're right around both 
89 to 90 pounds of uh, energy corrected milk for both both treatments. So fairly cons fairly uh, similar milk production for those two groups. And it's mainly because of the fat content. The fat percent was a bit higher for the cocktail mix, not significantly, but about a tenth of a point higher. So that made the fat yield. They're similar between the two treatments, about 3.9 to, to four pounds of fat uh, produced per day. As far as the protein percent, there was a significant improvement for the cocktail mix, about 3.45 to 3.38. So a slight improvement, but it was very consistent through the whole feeding trial as far as the protein percent being higher for the cocktail mix. And that made the protein production per day uh, similar between the two treatments, about 2.8 pounds. Whereas the lactose, there was a difference in lactose production, the control group. Um, they had a higher total milk yield. Uh, lactose percent generally doesn't, a, a, there's not a lot of difference between uh, across cows, even on different diets as far as lactose percent. So that led to the control group having a bit higher lactose yield. Uh, as far as MUN or milk urea nitrogen, no difference. So there's not a huge difference in protein uh, use by these animals. Uh, it, between the two different diets. As we'd expect, they're fairly consistently fed the same protein content. Now we'll kind of look over the course of the study, looking at different uh, changes. Um, so you can see they started off about 53 pounds, 52 to 54 pounds of intake at the start of the, the, the treatment period. And they actually, both treatments increased throughout the period. And I don't know if that's due to weather changes um, that's, that's going on there. They started in oh, like early, like late fall, October timeframe, and then starting in the early winter, maybe we had some effect of, of that going on with temperature changes. Um, so that, that was interesting to see, but really no, no difference, fairly consistent. Uh, in feed intake between the two um, treatments, but both of them did increase uh, throughout the study. If we look at fat percent, again, uh, the cocktail mix was slightly higher, but not significantly, maybe a tenth of a point. Uh, most weeks, except for at the end of the study, both of them kind of tailed off a bit, especially week eight, but fairly consistent about um, starting off about 4.5% and moving up to about 5% by the end of the study, um, which was, was quite interesting. We have protein. Uh, protein also increased throughout the study from about 3.1, 3.2 up to about 3.6% uh, protein. And there was a fairly consistent advantage to the cocktail mix. Um, treatment about, about a tenth of a point through the entire project. So when we look at the energy corrected milk, even though the control treatment had an advantage of about two, two and a half pounds of, of unadjusted milk, when we looked at the corrected milk, um, there was not a significant difference between the two and uh, across the treatment. There was a, by about week four, there was a, fairly consistent advantage, maybe about a pound, pound and a half. But across the whole study, um, not, a, not a significant difference. So in summary, um, as far as yield that we might expect in a system where we have a cereal grain forage and the cocktail mix combined, you'd probably expect about four to five tons likely um, between the, if you combine the two, uh, which is likely what's going to be the most common situation across Wisconsin. Um, you might be able to, to run into higher yields with very good, good condition and adequate nutrient applications, but I would probably be uh, a bit more conservative with that estimate. As far as quality, uh, the cereal forages were very high quality of those tested. Um, again, 
RQs of 200 to 250. For the cocktail mix though, is a bit more variable. So you gotta be uh, a bit more observant as far as uh, when you're harvesting these. Um, you wanna again, target for that uh, sorghum sedan grass, you're gonna be targeting that probably three foot height uh, at, at cutting to really get high quality feed for lactating dairy cows, if that's what you're feeding. If you're feeding for um, other uh, classes, so heifers, um, then you might, obviously you could let that uh, mature a bit more. And really the ryegrass content and the legume content are probably major drivers as well. So the higher ryegrass and legume content, you can get the probably the higher quality forage that you uh, will get as well. As far as the lactating cow performance that we saw, it was slightly lower um, for those animals that were fed the cocktail mix, um, but similar intakes, actually similar fat yields, similar uh, protein yields, just a bit lower in lactose uh, yield uh, compared to the control. So we're gonna do some more work with this, this data, looking at the economics, um, especially for the lactating cow side, looking to see, is it gonna be really economically uh, comparable to uh, a perennial type uh, forage system? And also we're evaluating diet digestibility. We have a, a postdoc Hadir who's uh, or visiting scholar Hadir that's working on that right now. So we'll be finishing that up fairly quickly. And that is it for me. I guess if there's any questions, I can address those. Yes, uh, Matt, uh, I'll invite people again if they want to put questions in the chat. Uh, that would be a good way. We have We have some time here. Uh, we did have one very early on, and I, uh, you were just on such a roll, I didn't want to stop you, but uh, okay. those earliest trials you're talking about, so I think he was referring to the Blondie work, and then you were calling it Peninsular. Uh, what, what were those actually? What was the seeding rate, uh, the seeding mixture? Oh, for the uh, I, I think that's an issue with these, uh, these cocktail mixes, you know, they're all, they're all a little different, so to just say, well, cocktail mixes feed dairy cows well, uh, you, you know, you gotta, gotta know what the mix is. So we had a question, what was actually in those mixes? Yeah, for the <laughs> data from the Marshfield Research Station and Peninsula Research Station plots, those were seeded at 35 pounds per acre, um, about, I think 60% sorghum sedan grass, 25% uh, Italian ryegrass, and then 5% from the Bersim, Red Clover, and Hairy Vetch. So similar to those first three farms uh, seeding rates. And that's fairly common, that mixture at 35 pounds, um, and then the warm season the annual, like sorghum sedan grass, and then the cool season uh, ryegrass and, and legumes. So that's probably the most common one that I see out there. Okay. And then uh, when you did that second set and you said you talked about this program of um, mm -hmm. uh, the winter cereal and then transition these cocktail mixes, uh, what were they, you gave the seeding rate, but did they uh, no-till those? Uh, did they kill the, the winter cereal besides mm -hmm. harvesting it? Or what happened in that transition space there? I think that depended on each operation. I'd have to look back for sure, but from my memory, the one farm did some tillage, and then they, after the cereal, cereal forage was taken off, and then they came back with the cocktail mix. One farm no-tilled it, and I think the other farm injected manure and then no-tilled it in after that. That's from my, my memory. What, at the Marshfield station, we no-tilled it into a cover of Italian ryegrass from the previous season. What we okay. Now we have another question. Uh, and I thought this too, um, this hairy vetch, is that just in there to, uh, oh, add more versatility and, and uh, look nice because it's very visual or uh, is hairy vetch more than a ground cover? Do you think that actually uh, is a, a positive contributor to the uh, feed value in these mixes? That's a good good question, Matt. 
as far as what we could tell in our plot work, it didn't contribute a lot. And then our field data from the um, at the Marshfield station, we didn't see, we saw very little actually emerge. And same thing at, at uh, from data from the other, from two of the farms, we didn't see a lot of that come through. Very little of the hairy vetch actually came through. Uh, if you could get so it established and get a good stand of it to come in, you probably, it, it'd probably help your protein content, possibly of, of the mix. But uh, at this point, it's not contributing a lot of yield to the to our data set. When I see it, it looks pretty delicate and looks like it would be a pretty high feed quality, mm -hmm. which is yeah, a yeah. specific question there, but it, you're saying it just there just isn't a lot of it in the mix, right? Yeah, it just didn't seem to um, take really well. And that, I don't know if that's just a, a management issue at seeding. Um, if that that's the issue, but we just didn't see it. I, again, I, I think you're right that the quality of it can be very good. It's just how much it contributes to the mix um, probably is highly variable. And as far as what I could tell, the two that contributed the most across different locations was the sorghum sedan grass contributed the, the main component in the first and second. And then the rye, Italian ryegrass contributed the majority of it, and especially the third and then some in the second harvest. So the grasses okay. are really probably, I think the issue might be is the grasses are dominating the legumes and shading them out is probably the likely issue. If they do get established, they probably get shaded out fairly quickly, especially if you're applying nitrogen to the, these fields. Right. I think there's some nice data from Kevin and Jarek and Carrie Lebowski as well that shows that with nitrogen that the, the legumes generally don't contribute very much to these cocktail mixes. Mm. So when we brought up Harry Vetch, uh, it brought on another question. And I think you probably answered it. There's not enough of it there maybe to cause a problem, but there's a uh, it's a nutrition-based question. Has anyone found the cause of hairy vetch toxicosis yet? That's, that's a good question. I am not very familiar with that issue. Um, maybe I should be, but I am not aware. And that's, I guess that's something we'd have to look into. So, But there's probably so little of it that we've seen in these mixes that we it hasn't been a concern so far is that correct? yeah yeah i don't i would not be concerned in these mixes it's just it's less than in all of our work it's less than probably five percent or less of the dry matter so i would not be i would not be concerned about that now if you get a, a stand that has a very high content of hairy vetch then you might need to think about think about that a bit more but i'm not i'm not um up on what hairy vetch toxicosis is or what it's caused by. Good question though. Okay, we had another comment there. Uh, sometimes cattle grazing pastures that contain hairy vetch die. Uh, last time they checked, no one was sure what compounds and plant parts were involved. So I, I mean, they probably have as much insight into it as we weren't grazing yeah. it and, and so forth, so. Yeah, it sounds like they know right. more about it than I do, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be nice to know. Maybe they could share if it looked like respiratory failure or, or, yeah, or if. Uh, that's yeah. interesting. That's something they have. If it's an issue, that we should probably look into that. All right, uh, Matt, I, I don't see any other questions and we did kind of grill you here at the end, so thank you. Yep, thank and, you. Uh, did you have anything else? You're, you're good for now? Yeah, I'm good. If there's any more other questions, you can either. Um, yeah, the, you the can still put your you questions can... in the chat if you had more questions for Matt. So yeah. thank you. So uh, I think we need to take a little time here to switch screens. But otherwise, we're going to switch over to uh, Luis Ferraretto. And uh, 
if you've been following this, uh, you've uh, you've met Luis. Um, he is a extension dairy nutrition specialist at UW Madison Animal and Dairy Science Department, and his research extent and extension interests are applied ruminant nutrition and management. His program is focused on understanding and improving starch and fiber utilization of dairy cows, corn silage and high moisture corn quality and digestibility. The use of alternative byproducts as feed ingredients, supplementation of feed additives to lactating cows and the development of on-farm and laboratory techniques for forage and feed analysis. And uh, he's gonna be talking to us uh, more on cocktail mixes uh, update on his research as far as how they ferment. So with that introduction, Luis, uh, you're free to go ahead. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining our uh, webinar series today. Uh, I promise I won't be too long with this presentation. Our goal is just to give you a, a short research update on some of the cocktail mix silage fermentation research that we are uh, working on. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, with Matt Akins in Marshfield. And basically what we wanted to learn was first, what is the true fermentation potential of some of those cocktail mix forages? But also we wanted to add a couple more things and try to learn a little bit of what are the effects of packing density, as well as using an oxygen scavenging product on the fermentation profile, nutrient composition, and aerobic stability. You'll see that I took aerobic stability out of the title there, because uh, later I'll tell you that we were unable to properly measure it, but that was one of our goals, right? Uh, Matt made some comments about the importance of fermentation quality during his presentation, and we will try to reinforce that. Okay, uh, briefly, uh, the crop portion of this study uh, is exactly what Matt presented for the feeding trial. And this was funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. And the silage analysis that we performed uh, was funded by the Hatch Project uh, 102.4417 from the USDA NIFA. So thank you uh, both uh, for funding and giving us the opportunity to run this project. So the reason why we decided to study a little bit of packing density is because we, we know for many, many years that there are many factors that affect uh, silage density. Some of those factors sometimes is hard to control, but regardless of the factor that is causing this issue, packing density is associated with dry matter loss, right? So, so basically, if you don't have very good packing, you will end up with a lot of oxygen in the silo. And then what is gonna happen is it will have a delay to reach this perfect, perfect fermentation case scenario, right? So what we want to happen is to have a silage that can start fermenting sugars very fast into lactic and acetic acids, reduce pH, and then become stable, right? The problem is, as you can see in this graph here, the worse the density is, more dry matter you lose, right? And the reason why you lose more dry matter is because the fermentation is not as good, right? So our question was, how does that affect the quality of fermentation of cocktail mixed forages? And then together with that, we also wanted to understand, well, if we have issues with packing for this forage, if we add, um, is a specific oxygen scavenging additive, which was based on sodium sulfite, sodium metabisulfate, and amylase, does it solve this problem, right? So here is just an example for you of uh, the type of silos that we used. Those were mini silos, okay, buckets, pretty much. And our goal was to first have a, a completely packed bucket, okay? And then based on the amount of forage we add to that silo or to the group of silos, if you will, we decided we would try 75% of the density and 50% of the density, okay? Uh, these are the calculated values for those. They are a little bit lower than what we expected them to be, but I think it was still, uh, 
a, a good test. And regardless, you'll see that they fermented very well, okay? And then for the silage additives, they are not microbial inoculants, that's a typo here. Uh, we had distilled water, exactly the same amount as we use for the uh, silage additive. All buckets, they were allowed to ferment for 30 days and they were in silo in quadruplicates. Okay? So our hypothesis for this study was last, the last spec, the forage easing the silo, worse fermentation is. And consequently, we will have uh, less dry matter recovery and worse aerobic stability. Okay, aerobic stability, basically the shelf life of the site. Okay, and our second hypothesis was that by adding an oxygen scavenging additive, we would mitigate some of those issues. Okay, so part of our goal was to learn about the interaction and not those independent factors. Okay, however, we didn't have any interaction. Okay, so I will discuss our results first, the density, and after that, the additive results. Okay, and I'm not going to show the interactions because we don't have any. Okay. In addition to that, here's the nutrient composition of the fermented uh, cocktail mix silage. The reason why I'm presenting only the average for you is because we did not have any effect of either density or additive on nutrient composition. Uh, if you go through, you'll see that actually this was a very digestible uh, forage. If you, if you pay close attention to the NDFD, I'm not gonna go through all, but I thought it was nice to show you, okay? I also wanna show you that, you know, even after 30 days of fermentation, we still had 5% water soluble carbohydrates, which kind of match with uh, what Matt presented and discussed about the amount of sugars in some of those mixes. Uh, and I think part of that explains why those uh, mini silos we had fermented very well. So moving to our uh, fermentation results, we analyze uh, a complete fermentation profile, okay? pH, lactic, acidic, propionic, butyric acids, and a couple of alcohols, okay? Butyric and propionic acid were not detected in any silos, okay? That's why we are not presenting them. Uh, ethanol was present uh, for all the silos, but we didn't see any differences so that's why those are not presented here, okay? But as we expected, or as we hypothesized, basically pH increase as density decrease, right? So the extra air inside those mini silos actually played a role, even though the difference is not huge uh, numerically here, you can see that there is an effect, right? And as you start moving towards the fermentation acids, like both lactic and acetic acids, they gradually decrease as density decrease, right? So I think this is a very strong evidence uh, in agreement with previous literature to show that um, density is also very important for cocktail mix forges, right? And then because uh, the fermentation acids were lower and pH higher, uh, the yeast and mold counts were also higher uh, as the density decrease confirming what we expected, okay? So now it was supposed to be the time that I show you the aerobic stability and how better it was for the 100% uh, packing density treatment. However, uh, what happens, uh, what happened with this specific experiment was we run an aerobic stability in the lab. And even though in theory, we have a temperature control room, uh, it's actually, uh, th there is a lot of heat or a lot of AC depending on the time of the year. In this case, it was uh, air conditioning. And uh, basically what it happens is the sample dry too fast, right? And because the sample dry too fast, we never break aerobic stability. So if I show you the aerobic stability data, I will show you, I, I would have show you the, the maximum amount of hours that we tested for, and then you would think the aerobic stability was great, right? And in reality, uh, that's not true, right? Uh, we could see that the silage deteriorated differently, but unfortunately we couldn't quantify. So please don't take the fact that uh, we didn't see changes in aerobic stability as those silage were equal in shelf life because they were definitely not, okay? 
Now, moving towards the additives results, uh, it actually goes against our hypothesis, okay? And before I go through those, I'll tell you that I do not have an explanation for that, okay? We thought that by using this oxygen scavenging product, uh, we would be able to see a better fermentation because in theory, would remove some of those uh, extra oxygen that we have for some of those uh, not well-packed buckets. And consequently, we would see less yeast and mold counts in good fermentation. But if you see these results here, you will see that pH, lactic and acidic acids were actually worse uh, for the additive, okay? Uh, Again, I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, I, I'm not even sure that, you know, how this would correlate to some of the larger silos uh, like piles, bunkers, et cetera. So I will take that a little bit cautiously because we are not really sure what's going on there, okay? Uh, when it comes to yeast and mold counts, we did not see any difference between treatments. And for dry matter recovery, it was slightly lower for the silage additive, even though that's a very small difference. So some of the implications for, for this short-term study was cocktail mix silage has actually a, a very good potential of fermentation. It looks like all of our silos fermented very well, even though we saw that aerobic stability was not great visually. And packing density remains a key step to ensure uh, that fuel oxygen remains in the silo and do not compromise silage fermentation, right? I think this was a, another good exercise to exemplify that with this forge. But unfortunately, under the conditions of our study, adding a, a oxygen scavenging additive actually did not improve silage fermentation. The fermentation acids were actually uh, worse. Okay, and we don't have an explanation for that. I think it will be very important. If, uh, our next step should be to evaluate some of the other additives, right? Uh, Matt mentioned uh, the use of ethero-fermentative microbial inoculants. I actually think that in the future, if we repeat that study, that should be one of the things that we should consider uh, to evaluate as this would be uh, a great improvement to aerobic stability, if aerobic stability is not as good as we think it is not. Okay. So here's my contact if you have any, any questions. Uh, and with that, Matt, uh, I'm open to questions or uh, to anything else that you need to, uh, to say. Oh, well, you don't have any questions yet. I just would like to confirm if I understood this right. So. Uh, these feeds were uh, higher in sugar after fermentation, and so they were not necessarily as stable as if more of that sugar had been converted to um, DFAs. Is, is that what I'm to get out of that? No, uh, the sugars were high before as well, right? I just showed the water-soluble carbohydrates that it remained very high even after fermentation. But the okay. micro microbes use uh, a lot of the water-soluble carbohydrates. Uh, I think part of the issue with aerobic stability that we had is, yes, you are correct. By having more sugars when we open, aerobic stability is expected to be worse because of yeast and mold proliferation. But in our case, I think the issue was the small amount of sample that we use for aerobic stability, and it dried too fast. So that's why we couldn't okay. really see the effect. And, and when you said uh, hetero fermenters, uh, that would be, uh, I think, uh, is that what like uh, Buchneri would, would be? Yes, yes, Lactobacillus Buchneri would be a perfect example of that. And what I think it could happen is either use some of this extra uh, sugar that is available or start using some of the lactate towards acetate and help uh, reduce some of the yeast and mold counts ensure good aerobic stability after that. Okay, well, uh, my colleagues <laughs> are trying to keep me a task here. You probably have seen that uh, there's a poll up there. It's how we evaluate our programs. So there's seven short questions <clears throat> that we'd really like you to answer um, as far as uh, 
your understanding of the topics today, the value you got out of it. So um, that is up. Um, there's still time to have more questions submitted to either Matt or Luis. Um, there's uh, some topics that we would like to uh, make you aware of that uh, are upcoming that uh, on the same uh, Badger Dairy uh, insight. So uh, this has been going on every two weeks. And so uh, we have uh, on March 15th, two weeks from now, we have the repro group talking about managing heifer maturity pre and post breeding matters. And that will be Paul Fricky. Um, Matt Aikens is gonna show up uh, as talking to us about repro that day. And also uh, Paul Fricky's uh, grad student, Megan Lauber. And then they're coming back two weeks after that on uh, the top topic is the randomness of repro. And that'll be uh, Paul Fricky and Tina Coleman, who is based in Fond du Lac County, a regional uh, dairy extension educator there. So there's those two meetings. And then on the alternative Tuesdays, uh, March 8th and March 22nd, a little bit different time schedule starting at 11 o'clock, a little bit longer going to 1.30. There, uh, we're gonna be addressing this topic of uh, dairy beef, beef dairy, um, cross calves and how there's more to it than just uh, making them black. So on March 8th at 11 o'clock, we're going to be doing uh, optimizing the value of dairy beef cross, uh, bull selection, and calf care. And then two weeks later on March 22nd, we'll be talking about uh, feeding management feeding management and marketing of those dairy beef calves. So those are topics that many of you here might be interested in and we just wanted to make sure you knew about that. So um, I'm seeing that the evaluation is not closed yet, I don't think. So, And, and then uh, again, you can go to uh, the Badger Dairy Insight. If you uh, do a search engine and look there and farm ready research, you'll find uh, the link to get to those. Otherwise, um, I think, oh, farm ready research is done for the winter season after April 22nd. So we don't have a lot more opportunities on this. They're free, but you do need to register to get the link. And otherwise I'm not seeing, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the other comments were there just uh, repeating what I, I had. So I think that's all we have for you today. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're glad that you were able to talk about uh, cocktail mixes and forages with us today. I'll just, we'll just give a few more minutes as people are still filling out the poll. There is Ashley Olson, the lady behind the curtain who didn't have a moment to talk to us today that made sure this all went off well. Thank you, Ashley and Jackie. Okay, I think I put everybody else in the waiting room. Way to go. They were still filling up full, Jackie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the number hadn't changed. That's why I ended it. Sorry. Jackie just ended the poll. She said, forget it. I'm just kidding. <laughs>